Hi everyone. So today we'll have the uh, next flow workshop session two. And this session is very important to understand the key concepts uh, of next flow. Uh, so with Sean and Nick, we will be presenting the basic key concepts. Then Sean, he will introduce, you know, how to have like when you will have yeah, uh, next flow project, how to structure it. And at the end of this session, Nick will uh, show a demo of uh, a workflow. In my case, I will make a short demo of how to run Hello World, you know, using uh, R script in next flow and Python script in next flow. So uh, that way you will have a better understanding of the basic concepts uh, behind Nextflow. And please don't hesitate to ask questions if you don't understand something. We are here to answer your question. So I will. Yeah, so uh, recap about uh, the session one. Uh, during the session one, we introduced workflow in general. What's uh, next flow? What's a workflow? We ran a demo example of RNA-seq workflow in GHPC, and we introduced you to the intro. Uh, we actually yeah, introduced you to NFCore. Uh, you will have in this uh, GitHub repository all the code and the slides we used uh, last time, and the ones also we, we will be using uh, this time. Okay, so when you will uh, start uh, Nextflow workflow, uh, you will start, you have to understand a basic concept which is, uh, sorry, there's a, like a sound. I don't know, what is it? Okay. Uh, My bad, that, that was mine. Sorry uh, about that. Okay, okay. Uh, so um, you have to understand the channels. Why channels are so important? Because they are a key uh, structure uh, in Nextflow. And what they do is they connect tasks to each other as shown in this figure, uh, and implement uh, functional uh, data transformation. Let's say you, we have a process. I will uh, explain what's a process. So we have a process here. We have another process. And what connects the two processes uh, are you know, the channels. So channels are really important to understand. And when you will have uh, to pass input, you know, to your process, you have uh, to pass it through channels. Depending on the data you have, uh, if you have a list of items, an array, another channel, or any uh, iterable object, you have to use the channel dot from. If you have a single value, you will use the channel dot value. If you have a file uh, of path, you will have you you use the channel dot from path. And if you have in case of uh, fast queue files, pair and reads, uh, of, and uh, pairs of files, you will be using the channel dot from file pairs. We will see some of these uh, during the demo, so don't worry if it seems too complex for you at the moment. Now, in our demo, we will be using uh, the channel dot value, the channel of, and then the channel from file pairs. The channel dot value creates a channel with a single value as shown in this example. And then if you want to view, uh, you know, what's the channel passing as uh, an input, you have to use a dot view. Uh, the dot view, it's like print, you know, in R or in Python. In case of you have uh, multiple uh, values, uh, comma separated, 
you will be using the channel dot uh, off and then uh, you will be you know it's like you viewing what the channel passing uh, as an in input uh, as uh, shown here the dot view and then you know your printed processing data for the it here it will go iterating you know through these uh, values and these arguments so in this case what it will um, be printed is processing data for chromosome one then the second iteration processing data for chromosome two processing data for uh, chromosome three so let's go to the demo and uh, we can have a look and understand it better. For the demo, I will be using, can you see here? So I, so can you see my terminal? No, we, we can only see the presentation, I think. Okay. Uh, maybe uh, uh, I finish the presentation and then I will go to the terminal. Uh, we have uh, in the code demo uh, this uh, Nextflow uh, uh, script, and uh, we will be during the demo uh, using this, you know, script channel.nf. And here, as I said, we will be printing this value and we will be printing, you know, uh, the chromosomes. And uh, the IT, you know, is a groovy like syntax and uh, it represents the current item. So it will go, you know, whenever like you're processing chromosome one, you know, it will put uh, here. So the value of IT will be chromosome one. In case you have uh, pairs, you know, of uh, in this case, a uh, fast queue, you will be using a channel dot from file pairs. You will be giving, you know, a name to the channel and we, you will be using dot view. Uh, this uh, from file pairs is very useful for grouping related input data files. So you have a uh, part and reads, uh, read one, read two, you have fast queue, you have, you know, it's like, uh, I don't know, FASTA files, whatever. So if you have this kind of pattern, you will have to use, you know, uh, this channel. And uh, you can have a data transformation. So in case you want to apply a function to each item of the channel, you will be using map. Then if you want to filter items based on a criteria, you will be using filter. If you want to take uh, the first N items from the channel, you will be using take. And then first, if you want to take the first element emitted by the channel. You can collect all items of the channel into a list uh, or array. Merge is very useful to merge multiple channels in a single channel. Reduce also reduces the item using a binary operator to produce a single result. You will be using, you know, a mix to combine multiple channels uh, by interleaving their items. And uh, finally, uh, in this data aggregation and combination, you can use combine to create a new channel by combining items from two channels per watts. Other uh, very useful functions are a group by to group items, join to join two channels, unique to emit only distinct items. Here in case uh, you can split CSV, you can split FASTA and you can split a FASTQ file into individual sequences. Uh, before going uh, to the process, so uh, I will uh, make a demo of the channel so you can see, you know, uh, what will be printed when we run those uh, scripts. I don't know why it doesn't show. Let me see again.
So, uh, yeah, let me know. I can't see the chat, so I don't know if there is a question here. Okay, so can you see my terminal now? Yeah, yes. I, I can see the terminal. Okay, that's great. Oh, what's this? Okay, so I, I have here the different uh, next flow scripts. And we will be running the channel.nf that I explained. It's important uh, to run next flow, you know, in the... Uh, folder where you have, have your uh, nextflow.nf. So here you will be using nextflow run. And if you have nextflow already, it's like when you use tab, you know, it will finish this and we'll be using the channel.nf. So in the channel.nf, uh, we have processing data for chromosome one. We have uh, GRCH38, processing data for chromosome two and processing data for chromosome three. We can see here, you know, it's like we had that the, the values, you know, it's like, um, it doesn't mean, yeah, it's like are not ordered. You know, uh, uh, the next flow doesn't process, you know, the data the way you introduce them. For example, we had first uh, GRCH38. Uh, so when it prints it, it prints it second, not first. And then we have this. So please be aware, you know, of that. And uh, yeah about channels. I will be running the uh, from file pairs. Please don't hesitate to ask question if you have uh, any question. And here, okay. So uh, here we have our uh, FASTQ files that are in a data uh, folder. And what we see that we have, you know, the two uh, FASTQ, like the path to the, you know, uh, FASTQ files. This, so the first pair, it's this one. And the second one, it's the, uh, you know, uh, underscore two dot FASTQ. And what uh, Nextflow does, you know, uh, so we have this pattern and it gives, it takes the name, you know, it parses it and it will take what is, you know, before uh, the pattern. That's why here it will give you the gigal underscore liver. So, uh, yeah, whenever you have, actually Shania will be, explaining more how to structure your next flow project but it's important to have the data folder and i will explain uh that it is also important to have your script in a bin folder so now i will go again to the presentation to explain the basic concepts about processes what's a process a process is a basic execution unit in a Nextflow pipeline. So we have a computational task and what it does, so it, it, it transforms the input data into output. When you write a process, you will be writing process and you will give name to your process. It's important also to know what's your input and what will be your output. And as I said, what type of input you have. 
So if you have uh, input channels or if you have a value as an output, if you have also output channels, if you have files, if you have values. So it's important here to have, you know, the right type of inputs and outputs. Here, uh, we will be running a demo about a very easy and basic uh, process. In this process, we will specify the next flow interpreter. Then it's important before, so there was version one, as we said, and uh, ver DSL version two. That's why I still actually, I'm not sure, yeah, if we still, we have to specify it, but you know, I got used to it. So I enabled here DSL two syntax. I have the process definition, the input here, it will be a value, input parameter X. The output will be what we will capture from the console. So it will STD out as output. And we are calling here an R script that pass, you know, a next parameter. Let's go to see the R script. I'm not sure if I, yeah, put the R script, but yeah, when I will go to the folder, so my R script will be in a bin folder. Why? It's important to have your scripts in a bin folder. So you, when you call, you know, your scripts, you will avoid to specify the absolute relative path. In this case, when I go to my terminal, I will go to the bin and you will see that all my scripts are here, you know, in the bin. When we'll have a look at the R script here. So what uh, the R script will do is to print the argument that we will give to it. You know, that's the only thing, you know, it will do. It's a very basic script. No, it's not. And um, one, one uh, important way that this differs from the examples we showed in the first session is, is that the script is just called by itself. And because of the first shebang line, it'll be correctly um, interpreted and and successfully run by the process. Yeah, um, it's a good punching. So here, yeah, we have the shebang, which specify, uh, which specify that it's an, an R script. So it's important when you have it in the BIM folder, it will go, it will recognize if it's an R script or Python script to run it. So it will, if you, if you don't have uh, your uh, script in the bin folder, you have to give the whole path, the absolute or relative path to that script. So we can run, uh, let's have a look at the before, at the, sorry, I forgot the name. Okay, let's have a look to the next flow. And maybe I will go again to the presentation and present the basic concept about a workflow. A workflow is a composition of processes and data flow logic, channels, operator, a basic workflow, so in case you have a workflow, you will call workflow. And then here, the foo could be a function, a process, or another workflow. We'll see a basic workflow in this example. So in our uh, next flow, we will have workflow channel because we will get the inputs from the channel. We will set here dot set. It will give the name to the channel. 
So this will be the name of the channel, input underscore ch. And then uh, we will have our process that we will call get input. And we will pass, you know, the channel to the process. We will use, you know, dot view to print the output. And here you have to close the workflow definition. So our input will be coming, we will pass the input to the process through the channel. So it will be hello and word. Okay, before going to the example of Python, I will go again to the command line and I will run this R hello world. So here it's processing, it will put one of two, two of two, 100%. And it will print word and hello. Is there any question? I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, please. So when you make the NF to, uh, previous slide, you generated the process uh, workflow the module. Yeah. So in then in this uh, uh case. The indentation is critical, such as the Python code? Ah, it's a very good question. Uh, actually, yeah, for example, in this uh, process, you know, you have to put all this, you know, not at the same level of the process as you see here. So you have to pay attention to that. And then if you want to uh, like make comments, you do it this way. But for example, uh, you can have errors, you know, if uh, this input, it will be here. So yeah. Is that true? So uh, that wasn't true in DSL1. Did something change? Because I, I thought that since oh, this was based in Java, it would not in be In my possible. case, sometimes it gives me error. OK. So maybe that's a new thing. Yeah. OK. So it will depend on the kind of method that you are using. Oh, we can't we can't oh. hear it by the way you may ah, need the mic uh, to the board room okay we we can't hear, hear you so can you yeah talk yeah okay okay uh yeah uh i have to double check but you know for me it's like uh the process it's better to write it this way so you yeah to avoid like some errors i mean it it could also depend on um the version the file. Of the yeah that if you're defining the process versus outside of the process definition, or if you're writing a separate modules file, in yeah. the, the white space may not matter um, to the same degree. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I will go to the Python part. And actually, the Python script, it's almost the same as the R script. So we will get the first uh, argument passed in the comment line and from the channel. So we will print it. And then, uh, you know, uh, yeah, let me uh, explain again. So we will get uh, the first argument and uh, we will print it here, okay? So the message is to get the first argument and here it's to print it. And as I said, the inputs will be coming past, uh, yeah, via the channel to the process. Okay, 
so yeah I will go here before and I will uh, run the Python next flow so next flow run and then by so it will print here we see that two of two hello and work so as we see yeah here because uh doesn't mean that when you provide as i said to the next flow hello first and where word uh, you know second that it will print it in the same order so we see that for example here word hello and in this case hello word yeah it's very important as i said to have it let me go again yeah to talk about that point so you have your next flow here you have your being you know on the same level and on the bin you have your r or python script so that you have to only you know now call the script by its name. That's all. Because when the process run next flow will prepend bin to the path. So you will see the whole path, you know. Otherwise, if you don't have it this way, you have to provide the absolute or relative path to the script. Uh, uh, what I want to uh, if, if, for example, if I have a uh, code that is written in, in Python in Bing or in, in R, I can I can have these two linguistic scripts in the same bin. Yeah, 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 yeah. In this case, we have it in the same bin. Let me show you. So, uh, ls. Uh, I don't know why it's like that. Yeah. It's got, I don't know where I will do here. Oh, I think it's it's stuck. Um okay. Um if we go to the bin here, you will see that we will have the Python and R script. Okay. Let's yeah. Okay, so now Sean will explain about um, how to structure your uh, next row project. Yeah, so hopefully everyone can see um, the project structure and organization slide. Um, Thanks so much, Hadia. Um, and yeah, I, I wanted to include this to talk a little bit about um, what a project might actually look like in the wild when you're looking for a specific um, NF core uh, workflow, for instance, for a specific, specific uh, bioinformatics task. Um, oftentimes, you'll find that um, one will designate a main.nf workflow file, and that that's kind of the main workflow file that is intended to be run with Nextflow run. Um, but then um, in Groovy syntax and in Nextflow syntax, there's the concept of modules, which is um, something to be aware of. And it loosely describes um, files such as processes, workflows, or functions. And so typically in the main uh, folder of a project, you'll find a subfolder called modules, and that may have uh, many, many, many different um, files. Oftentimes, these are just processes, individual or sets of processes, and even individual workflows. And some or all of those may be used um, depending on you know the project development uh, cycle and and versioning. Um, and uh, when a module is actually loaded into a workflow file, it's it's usually at the top, so before any processes are defined. But after the shebang or the header comments, there is a call to simply include uh, some module declared by name. And that's that's shown here. And then um, from uh, some subfolder, such as the module subfolder. 
And then um, the next uh, concept to become familiar with are the uh, configuration files. And so these are um, one or many files with the .config uh, extension. And um, a little bit more about these. So configuration files can be very helpful for um, fine tuning uh, the parameters of a workflow run. And they um, oftentimes uh, define important variables that are used by the workflow processes or in the workflow definition. They also introduce a concept of um, um, profiles, which can be specific to your compute environment and can state for instance, the number of CPUs or the amount of memory that um, the workflow run will consume. Um, and as Hadia mentioned, um, if projects aren't incorporating like a bin folder, then you likely will see um, in the config file or in the process definitions um, at variables such as launch directory for the relative path or variables for the absolute path. And so these are important for um, say pointing um, a um, process to the path of like a summarized experiment file or fast queue file that needs to be identified by a channel to then be fed into a process. And um, in the config files themselves, so there's a default behavior to these. And um, you may see that a, a config file will uh, load um, other config files with the include config call. So um, that's uh, co configuration files in summary. And then I wanted to show an example where I um, wrote a Nextflow workflow to handle um, deconvolution benchmarking. And um, what's kind of neat about this is it just demonstrates these default behaviors that I just described using the config files. So um, if we read from left to right, we have um, some CSV table where I'm say uh, saving the path to summarize the experiment RDA file. And then I wrote a simple script to update a params.config file. And the example for the params.config is, is depicted at the bottom left. So this defines um, a path for a results folder and then a path for a modules folder, modules dir. And then these use the launch dir, um, dollar sign launch dir to show the relative path to the subfolders. So those are um, written to params.config. And then nextflow config is loading params config by using include the include config variable. And that example is shown at the bottom right. And um, again, that includes the relative path with the um, launch dir variable. And then the default behavior of the main.nf workflow file would be to just identify the nextflow config file and load its contents, which would then load the params config contents. So this is convenient because it adds a layer of abstraction. So I could write a simple um, wrapper script that is um, simply um, saving a new value to the CSV table, writing values to params config, and then running main to NF. And then it will um, identify the updated paths and run uh, normally. So you can access that at the link provided. And there's also a link uh, in that blog post to the GitHub repository where this is used. Um, and then just in, in summary, um, we'll have Nick um, show an interactive session on JHPCE. Um, but many of these concepts, um, the dollar sign launcher, and then um, Hadia mentioned like uh, IT and several other variables that are just kind of baked into the Groovy syntax. You can uh, research them independently and just be aware that there's many of those um, that you might encounter in the wild and that um, you may just want to Google to find out if they're not defined explicitly, what are the variables for and, and kind of how are they used. Um, so I will stop sharing and let Nick take it away. All right, yeah, thanks. Um, so yeah, for this next session, I will um, be doing a demo and rather than um, um, doing slides, I would recommend um, we have all of this content on the um, GitHub repository. So I'd recommend following along with that because there's a few different components. And I at least find it sort of difficult to follow along um, or remember all the details. I don't know. So I, I tried to include um, sort of links to specific code that's um, 
different between the two versions of the code we'll be looking at. So this demo will um, be focusing on trying to adapt an existing workflow um, and make it into a next flow pipeline. So I think that's like a common thing people try to do. Um, so yeah, it, I would recommend checking out this readme in our um, GitHub repo, which I added to the R Stats Club sheet. Um, it wasn't there at first, so sorry about that. But um, so yeah, we have this. I'm, I'm just gonna show, um, I'm gonna be doing this demo actually at JHPC though. Um, so I just got a um, interactive session. And um, so first I think we can check out the, um, I'll show you, let's say we have an example pipeline that we've um, been just doing as a series of shell scripts. So let's say we have this, um, a linear order where we just have like three different tasks that we're, we're going to manually submit shell scripts one after the other. And let's say that's just how our workflow is for now. And then later we'll show to change that into next flow, but just to get familiar with it. Um, so actually I'll go back to this readme because I think that's, that's a little more helpful. So the overall idea is that we're, there's going to be three steps here. Um, the first is going to take a couple of fast queue files and we're going to run fast QC. Um, so the important thing there is that we're basically just running a program that you can call from the command line. Um, we're running it one at a time. So as a shell script, that's gonna we're gonna implement that as an array job. Um, so we're gonna be each um, we're basically running fast QC on each file independently. Um, okay, so then the next step will be once we get those fast queue results, fast QC results. Um, we're going to take, take the output summaries and just like the first process, we're going to do this as an array job, one sample at a time, but we're basically going to, um, just filter that summary to find what the failed metrics were. So FastQC outputs like a bunch of different metrics and then some may pass or fail. And so we're just going to take the ones that fail, um, just as an example. Uh, and then in the final step, we're going to be basically aggregating all those summaries. So. In this example, we only have two samples, but the idea is we're going to be taking both those filtered summaries and then we're going to combine it into a single CSV and then report a couple of statistics on it. Um, so yeah, let's go back to the um, example here. Um, so yeah, I mentioned as the the first two, two um, steps are going to be array jobs. So that will show up as like, we've covered those like, a little bit before, but um, it'll be in basically this line. Um, and then the last one will be just an ordinary shell script that um, not an array job because we're upper, we're doing all samples at once. Um, but yeah, so just to show you what that would look like in terms of actually running it, just to to um, uh, what is it? Let's see. So everything will be in this demo existing scripts directory. I don't think I said that out loud. Um, but in terms of actually running this workflow, it would just be like, let's say we had a, these, the series of scripts, we're just going to be using S batch to submit it to the, to the cluster. Um, so actually I need to enter the, uh, original scripts directory. Um, and so, yeah, we would, we would simply just run it like this. And then once that was done, um, we'd execute the next script. So, uh, yeah, already that's like, that may be like a common and simple um, way to implement a workflow, but Nextflow improves upon that because you don't actually have to manually wait for things to finish. It just um, sends the input, the outputs from one step to the input to the other without, you know, having to wait and stuff. Um, so that should be pretty quick. And just to show you like where these results would be, um, we're basically writing it to just like a, an output folder. Um, and yeah, um, I think I'll, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, this should be quick. So um, we would basically just do this. We would submit it as a series and um, all of the, the outputs would be in this output folder. Um, that should, um, This should be pretty quick. Um, we ran FastQC, we filtered each of the summaries, and I'm going to just run the third one just to 
show you what the outputs look like. Um, so yeah, each of these, you notice there, like I, as I mentioned, um, the first few, the fast queue step was an array job. So we had, we had two samples, so it gets executed twice. Same with this filtering step. And then our final step is just one job. And um, I'll show you why I keep uh, <laughs> um, reiterating it in a second. Um, so yeah, um, in this output folder, we have these fast QC results. Um, we have the filtered summaries that were in that second step. And then the final step gives us a um, combined summary. And just for to get you guys familiar with it, it's just like, we have the sample ID, we have like a bunch of metrics and then all of them failed. So, um, <clears throat> cause we are filtering for the ones that failed. Um, okay, so now that we've introduced those scripts, I wanna show you how that actually translates to Nextflow, which I think is the more interesting part. Um, okay, so in, in here, in the original scripts, like I said, we had just um, three shell scripts and maybe those internally called R or Python scripts. Um, so in the next little version, um, I put everything in this main.nf file. So as um, Sean and Hedia mentioned, um, sometimes you have modules, you can have multiple uh, files for this. But since this is a small example, I just put it in a single file. Um, so the first way that this translates to an Excel pipeline is that each shell script, and you, <clears throat> you'll find this usually works, but each shell script here becomes a single process. So our first um, FastQC shell script becomes this FastQC process and same for this um, these filter summaries and gather summary step. <clears throat> um, and then the other thing is that often you can sort of just take the contents of the shell script and then put it in the shell block and it mostly will work. I'd say one difference is that um, Nextflow operates on like each process is run in a work isolated working directory so as long as you input the file in the channel, you can call it by um, by its name and not using a full path. So like in our shell script example, we were using um, like actual the, the full path, but that's that's something that will change with next next flow because you it's always going to be the like the relative base name of the the file. Um, that's the first detail. Let me go back to the um, main.nf. Um, so, um, the other detail is like, um, you'll have to actually, I guess this, the workflow part is something you'll have to manually specify, but that's often a matter of, for this linear workflow, we're just specifying, um, so I guess the first step, we actually have to import the fast queue files from a channel for using their path. Um, rather than just specifying the absolute path as we did in the shell scripts. But then from there, um, you can kind of just sequentially call these processes um, each time using the output from the previous one. So that's using this like dot out. Um, <clears throat> and I guess the parallelism here is actually sort of implied. So um, like in this case, we have two fast key files. Um, and so when you execute FastQC with this channel that includes two items, Nextflow will naturally run it as two different um, instances of the process. So you get sort of an, a parallelism just built in. And like, it's almost as if we're running an array job, but um, like more asynchronously, I guess. Um, and the same for this filter summaries. Since we're taking the output of a channel that includes two items, it'll be two different summaries from the FastQC. QC files um, that will also run a process twice, one, one trick for each sample. Um, the, the key difference in the last process, since we're ga gathering all these fast QC summaries, um, we actually want to run this a single time and include the summaries from all the samples. So how does that differ? Um, it differs using this um, dot collect operator. So what that does is it says like, I wanna take all the items in the channel, which would be the um, filtered FastQC summaries. Um, and I wanna combine it into a single item, which will be a list. And I'm, I'm just gonna run the process once on all of those items. <clears throat> so that's how we have like, um, we have sort of two different versions of processes, right? We have 
one where we're writing things one at a time and the other where we're running it all at once. So operators like dot collect can be useful for that. Neat um, here. So it's like uh, what you have filter summaries is the name of the process. Yeah. Then dot out because yeah, it will be the output and then filter summary. It will be the name of the channel if I'm not wrong, right? And yeah. dot collect, so it will collect all the outputs from uh, that yeah output like channel yeah um yeah i could have probably described better the so these names come from the um like when it says die out dot full summary die out dot filter summary those names are actually coming from um here so when we define the output channel for each summary we use this like emit option and then you can give the the channel name so here we're taking like the the csv that gets output and we're calling it filtered summary and um, similar for FastQC, we have, we call it full summary, and that's so that's where those names come from. Um, <clears throat> um, so yeah. Uh, oh, one more detail. So I I sort of skipped over, but um, if we look at the original shell scripts, one thing that I didn't talk about was managing um, software. So I for the FastQC step, we're loading a FastQC module. Um, for this filter summary step, we're we're loading R, so um, also a module. So yeah, we're loading modules in these shell scripts. So how does that translate to Nextflow, where we have different processes and stuff? Um, so that translates into a configuration file. Um, so I I'll show you. Uh, actually, I'll start with a Nextflow dot. Sorry, I'm. Uh, I'll start with this nextflow.config file. So that's will be in the same directory as your like workflow scripts. Um, and so here I actually wrote a profile to allow this to work on JHPC using Slurm. Um, but all I'm saying here is like I want to define a profile called JHPC, and then it's going to use this file as a, as its configuration. Um, so that file is right here. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, in terms of using the software, we actually can call these processes by name um, and then specify what module gets loaded when running these processes. So that's sort of how we are using the software. Um, I don't know, if we end up doing another session, we could probably have to go into more detail on that because there's configuration is kind of a, its own thing. Um, oh yeah, and then memory and... Uh, CPU options, you can, in this case, since all of these don't require much resources, you can specify the, the same resources for all processes. Um, and then using Slurm is just a matter of this single line. Um, since Nextflow knows how to interact with Slurm, this is just telling it to run each process as a S batch, like a submitted job. Um, so it's as easy as that. There's no nothing really more complicated for the Slurm aspect of it than that single line. Um, Okay, so actually running this, right? So how, how do we do that? Um, I'm going to uh, move to the other, the next little version. Um, and in here we have all our files. Um, so I am going to load a module that loads in Nextflow. Um, and I don't remember the version number, but I remember it uses the most the recent one we have. So I'm gonna do that. Um, so yeah, this is how you do it at HPC. Um, and so in, in terms of invoking the pipeline, we would do next flow run um, main.nf since that's our workflow script. Um, and I just mentioned that we have a configuration profile. So um, we use that doing by doing um, this dash profile and then the name of the profile as we defined it in that nextflow.config file. Um, and then this would, um, this was just running the pipeline interactively, but we can see how that sort of maybe differs from um, sequentially executing those shell scripts as we originally had them. Um, no space left on device. Okay. Oh, there's always like something weird that happens when you're trying to present. Um, <laughs> so um, I'm not actually even sure what to do about that. If that's the system wide temp directory. Um, I 
guess I assume it'll just say the same error, but um yeah, I've never seen this error. That's crazy. Um <clears throat> I think uh how can we do this with um uh, one question, Nick, here, the yeah. profile is LERM or JHPC? Uh, so the profile is called JHPC. So um, in this next level, that config file, you have the names of the profiles. Oh, okay, so, okay, yeah, JHPC. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, which then gets defined in this script. Um, so I'm not really sure how to go about around the working with this temp directory. Um, I think there might be a... It's okay, uh, then move on, I think. Sorry? Uh, yeah, if there is like this, uh, no space left on the device, maybe, yeah. We can move yeah. on to the, yeah. We don't have much time in it. I could try to live debug this because I think there's an environment variable. Like only closes, four but... minutes left. Yeah, <laughs> we can probably leave questions or... Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Stuff like that. So I will um, probably exit actually. And um, yeah. And maybe, yeah, so I will be presenting the last slide. Let me present, where is it? So for further readings, uh, we provided these links last time and we provide again those links. Uh, so the documentation of Nextflow is amazing. You will have all the details here. If you are interested in one of the pipelines of the NF core, please go to the pipelines and have a look at it. Maybe you will find a pipeline that is useful for you. And then uh, we have, you will find all the materials uh, and the demo we did and all the scripts in this uh, GitHub repository. And uh, also please go to the Slack. They have an amazing Slack where you uh, can ask questions. The community is very active. And as I said, their YouTube channels, they have many tutorials in many languages. So yeah, go ahead and look for, yeah, it's like, or uh, have a look at their YouTube channels, or uh, if you have any question, go to um, uh, NF Core Slack and uh, ask questions. And yeah, and go to this tutorial to learn more about Nextflow. And please, if you have any other question, don't hesitate to ask questions now. And don't be scared when you have yet yeah, to write your first next flow. Start with the channel. Try to view what you're passing as an input. Many times the, if the path is wrong or yeah, you will get an error that you won't understand. So go step by step. Okay, I have this process. What's, you know, it's like I'm passing as an input what I'm getting as an output. And check each process uh, until making a workflow. Because sometimes the errors, yeah, in Nextflow are not easy to understand. There are so many things there. And the tiny thing, you know, can you can look for it like for hours or maybe days. Uh, I have one question here, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the second slide you today you showed me that uh, the, the, there's a, a diagram about channel. So the channel is basically the queuing system, but first in last out system. Do you think? Uh, sorry, can the you channel? The yeah. channel. Do you think the data structure is about the uh, FILO? The first thing, last. Uh, I mean, first thing, first out the the queuing mm -hmm. system. Am I right? Q system like Q. Yeah, it's a it is yeah. a Q. It's first yeah. Q system. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank right. you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and check you know the names and everything. Yeah. So channels are really important, as Nick yeah showed because 
as an input, you will have a channel and you will get a channel, you know, for your output. So naming them, checking all the names, checking, yeah, everything like in the process. Uh, yeah, it's really important. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I don't know if you have any other question, but please don't hesitate to go, yeah, to have a look at the documentation. And as Sean said, it's a groovy syntax. So maybe sometimes you don't find it in the documentation, but you will find it, you know, in groovy like uh, tutorials or documentation. 